Does anyone here have a pet peeve about their tech stack, infrastructure, development cycle, or such? Something that really triggers you and you really want to change it? Me too! I call it anger-driven development. It's great. I think a lot of these pet peeves fall under the technical debt umbrella. And who doesn't love discussing technical debt? It's the most colorful bike shit. Applying some recency bias, I listened to two talks, one by John Thornt Thornton, sorry. <laughs> we like talking about technical debt so much that there seems to be a talk about it in approximately every Staff Plus or Lead Dev or any other event. Applying some recency bias, I listened to two talks, one by John Thornton from Lead Dev last year and one by Amir Safavi in the recent Staff Plus in London. They talked about using technical debt intentionally, looking to the future and what opportunities choosing to take on debt now will unlock later, just like taking on a mortgage. But unlike a mortgage, technical debt doesn't always come with a payment plan, or said payment plan has been deprioritized three times five years ago, and the document that outlined it has long since been forgotten. Thus, all these problems remain so that they can become our pet peeves. Hurrah! We probably love talking about technical debt because we see it everywhere. However, having the tragic life that we do as responsible engineers, we know that we will never have time to tackle all the problems we see. Resolving to ignore yet another problem, we will rant about it to a sympathetic audience for at most two hours in total. Then we will set the problem aside and put our efforts on things the organization actually cares about. But when we bump into that triggering pet peeve, we simply can't resist it. And we take a closer look. Maybe you're looking at a haunted graveyard, code or components that sort of works, but no one who's still around understands and people are simply avoiding. Maybe you're looking at a database schema that is causing your service performance problems, preventing it from scaling well to its new needs. This is the cost of the system being successful. It has to evolve. Maybe you're looking at that regrettable API, which none of your users understand how to use, and it's about 10 times more complex than it should be, both in how much code it requires and the behavior it yields. Or, you know, anything that's serving traffic and is more than three months old, really. Whichever type of tech debt you might be looking at, we tend to jump into the technical details and think about how to fix it. But what if instead of zooming into the details of your newfound pet peeve, you started by zooming way out? Today, I'm going to tell you a tale of one such pet peeve, which triggered me and how it taught me to better approach my peeves, past, present, and future. Like most stories, we will start at the beginning, in the weeds. In February 2021, about three weeks into my time at Datadog, I was a pup. See what I did there? Good. I discovered we had a database that many teams shared. Questions started popping in my head, uninvited. Could I write a query that would lock up a bunch of the database, resulting in rejecting writes for a while? And if so, what will happen? How will we deal with it? Who owns this database? Is there a team that's maintaining it? They probably have to coordinate with all of these people every time they need to do a rolling restart. That doesn't sound like fun. I won't bore you with my imaginary catastrophe scenarios. But this was going on for a while. I was coming from a place where everything was microservices after spending years working on large scale infrastructure as a developer and as an SRE. The reliability engineer within me was banging on the doors to be unleashed. The hell with being new on the job and having no social capital to draw on. This is important. It must be fixed now to avoid higher costs. Oh, sweet summer in her SRE. You should stick around and listen to Randall's talk about generic good stuff this afternoon. You might learn something. Anyway, I thought we should fix this database and I may have written something about it in response to a prompt from my SVP at the time. They, in turn, kindly informed me, fast, privately, and in no ambiguous terms, that this is not a problem, and I should absolutely drop it like it's hot. In other words, we had bigger fish to fry, and that was not causing us pain. Yet, shouted my inner SRE, not yet. 
As I was minding my own business, the single database topic kept coming up. Teams clearly had a love-hate relationship with this database. They would complain about the database all the time. There were incidents every so often because teams did occasionally step on each other's toes. And maintenance is a real thing. And yet, teams chose to use this database instance. It's understandable that we started out with a shared database when the company was small, and it grew organically. So for many workloads, it's momentum in addition to familiarity. But I was puzzled by those new things that were getting added, even when they could have been built on a different stack. Foolish puppy me. I asked some team why they can't just create a new database instance for their use case. My new database instance suggestion was met. Was met. My new database instance suggestion was met with quite a bit of resistance, and I wasn't quite sure why, so I poked around a bit. Now, it might be a pertinent detail that Datadog has a multi-cloud environment because we cohabitate with our customers. It turns out that a multi-cloud environment is a royal pain in the ass, even if you use seemingly the same cloud managed solution, in our case, Postgres, owned by and run by the provider, they still are different infrastructures in many ways. Just as an example, each provider sets different limits on how many read replicas you can have for each instance. Having to deal with three different infrastructures directly was more than any team was willing to take on. There was no abstraction there in place to observe these infrastructure differences. Conversely, the shared database is critical enough that there's a team of experts responsible for it. It's not because of your workload, but you get the benefits nonetheless. Practically speaking, the team responsible for this Postgres instance was serving as the company's abstraction layer, keeping the lights on, managing the differences between cloud providers in some form or another, and sparing engineers who are working on product features and really just need their database to work. So, avoiding dealing with disparate infrastructures was why teams refused to create database instances for themselves. Huh. My second, wait, what, on the job turned out to be another piece of the same puzzle. This was also a little over three years ago. My starter project was closing a bit of a niche gap in our storage solution offerings, globally distributed storage. I was intent on delivering that not a care in the world developer experience, but hit an unexpected point of friction. One team asked us to grant their internal users direct access to their data in the new storage system. I didn't bat an eye before saying, no, if you need to share this data, build a service on top of it and have your users access the data through your service, as though it was obvious. But letting other teams query our data directly is how we do it now, they said. I froze for a minute, processing. Okay, I said. But it's not a great pattern for all of these reasons, and it's better for you to have a service in front of it. They replied, Tali, pulling up a service is going to take a while. We didn't really factor that in scope for this project. I promised them I'll help get it done this way, and I did. And so I learned that pulling up a new service was a little more involved than I had imagined it to be. How long will it take in your company to develop and deploy in production a Hello World gRPC service? In my head, it was about four hours. I was very detached at that point from Datadog's reality at the time. Putting these two together with the power of hindsight, in addition to the multi-cloud infrastructure differences being a hindrance, people were choosing to have their schema be their API because building a service API was too much work. So while I may not like the fact that we share a database. At least now I had a sense of why. I can understand how we got here and why this is still the case. Taking a few steps back, I realized it's all about the context. Some of the most eye-poking technical debt I've seen in my career was not a result of engineers making careless choices. They're a result of the circumstances of the time. This is important to note because if the circumstances that created your pet peeve haven't materially changed, this may be the wrong time to tackle this project. You must be thinking, come on now, the circumstances you've described can be changed. You're absolutely right. 
but we need to know about all of these circumstances and how they bear on our pet peeve to be able to do anything about them. Okay, so let's say I could go back in time and share with Tali circa 2021 all of this relevant context. What could she have done differently with that information? Okay, we have two big problems feeding into a third one. We need the cloud providers abstracted away from our experience of using databases. That means having a team that built out this layer, owns it and maintains it at scale. Pulling up a new service should be simple. That means we need a team that would build out a framework, auto-generated code, streamlined deployment tools, out-of-the-box monitoring. Then when we have those in place, we can start working on the thing we actually wanted to do which is to break down this monolithic database to smaller, reasonable domains. And as we all know, we will gain many nice things from doing all of this. Is it worth it? Those are actually a lot of big investments. For people who have been living with the shared database for years and maybe haven't seen an environment like the one we're aiming for, it's also a leap of faith. While sharing a database instance has drawbacks, why would any of this help? And what other problems will it introduce and then how are we going to solve all of them? Okay, depending on your or past me's standing in an organization, you could make an overarching plan. Then keep it to yourself and sell it piecemeal to various areas of the organization for their own intrinsic value. Pick one of these efforts, identify which team might be a good candidate for leading and owning it. Develop the vision with them Maybe outline some incremental milestones with clear value in shorter timeframes. Disappear and let them champion it themselves as something that's worth doing and worth doing now. If you can't get people excited about the effort in question, you're either barking up the wrong tree or it's not actually solving a painful problem yet. Rinse, repeat with the other effort and another team. This plan could work provided that these efforts are solving real problems are worth doing on their own, and that the organization is ready for them, meaning it's mature enough for long-term investments, big enough to have experienced the problem firsthand rather than trust anyone that something will eventually become a problem, and believe that these problems warrant solutions. And I could tell you that I did actually travel back in time and that I made my past self look like a genius who understood how all these pieces came together from the get-go and orchestrated this whole thing but I would be lying. I used the very different but well-known strategy, biding my time and being lucky. Let's take a look at what else was happening around me while I was biding my time. On the storage infrastructure side, teams were internally delivering a few storage as a service solutions in late 2021, which garnered accolades around their user experience. My team's globally distributed storage service was very stable, with a dedicated team holding the pager. Onboarding with it was simple, starting from creating a new instance through the whole development cycle and deployment. Another team was offering caching as a service, replacing a shared and unreliable monolithic cache. It was fully self-service and the caching team was responsible for the operations of all instances. The idea of teams building infrastructure services to be run at scale was starting to appeal to people across the company and it paved the path for finding other opportunities of the sort. After a period of debates, questions, and rumor mills, a vision developed that was quite close to Postgres as a service. The Postgres service became generally available in the beginning of this year, but even in earlier stages of its development, people were shifting their thinking around having a database instance for themselves. More teams were asking to be early adopters for this service then the Postgres as a service team had capacity to onboard. Remember this, one down, one to go. Then the Postgres as a service team had capacity to onboard. Remember this? Meanwhile, on the services are easy front, back in January of 22, the application infrastructure organization started working on a framework that would make it easy to get a running service with best practices built in. This effort was kicked off on its own merits, completely unrelated to my pet peeve. It took about 18 months to mature enough to move the needle on engineers dreading to create new services. 
You see where this is going? In addition, it's worthwhile to note that Datadog grew more than twofold throughout this time, from about 2,000 people when I started to about 5,000 at the end of 23. It meant we were starting to hit the scaling limits of some of our existing solutions. Teams were beginning to look for ways to have more control over their schema and better isolation from other workloads. Two down plus bonus company readiness factor. Meanwhile, I went on maternity leave. I came back from maternity leave. I was trying to figure out what my job was again and what had happened in my absence. And then around December of 22, I found myself a partner in crime and we started working on the project to break up the database. A partner in crime may not be a necessity for everyone, but for me, and maybe also for Rick, it carries some validation that the time is right. One staff engineer willing to embark on this journey might still be brushed off as insane, but two? That might make the naysayers pause for long enough to not actively stop you. Plus, you'll carry each other through the hurdles of a long and potentially contentious project like this one. And the hurdles were not late to come. In part because of the vision for the database service still not being crisp, and in part because of my own personal biases, the first document we wrote about this outlined a plan like, if any other team is using your data, build out a service. That's actually a big if. The fact is the teams may not be aware that another team is using their data. Hmm. Migrate everyone to your service, again, under the assumption you know who everyone is. This will enable figuring out this database business without disturbing your users and with only little disturbance to you. Let me paraphrase this. Every team will do a bunch of work that will solve a small fraction of their problems and trust that we'll figure something out in the meantime. To be clear, I take the blame for this one. I may have swept Rick with my charismatic idealism. That plan had a lot of people nodding, but not anyone actually motivated to do the work. It outlined some ideas really well, and we still reference it when relevant but that was just not going to work. We realized we need to meet them where they are, which means now that we have the big picture and the context all sorted, we're allowed to get back into the weeds. In fact, we must. We need to understand the database itself and how it's being used. How big and hard is this problem in practice and who are our partners for this journey? We spent hours in conversation with various experts trying to ask the right questions. We were looking for mechanisms that Postgres already has that could be used to set some ownership boundaries in a controlled and incremental way. We spent hours with our coworkers in database monitoring, sharing a slew of feature requests we believed could be useful to our customers as well as a result. We were looking for insights on how hard this will be. What tables are connected with either foreign keys, joins, or nested queries? We asked teams which part of the database they owned. You may not be surprised to hear there are some disputed territories as well as no man's lands. And of course, both at the same time. We categorized them and had some idea of which we try to lure in first and which are going to be late adopters. We described how our interests support those of the Postgres as a service team. As a result, more people were involved and excited about this. Then they saw how some of their interests support those of the API framework teams. Synergy! We debated how to walk the path, be it self-service, mandates, and everything in between. We discovered that people are quite interested in getting this done and having their data out of this database at this point, but that potentially in this case, aiming for self-service off the bat might be a tall order. Too much can go horribly wrong. In the end, it took almost a year to clearly formulate a plan and get it approved. I mean, we were doing other things in parallel, okay? That plan started from where we actually were, and it outlined how we could safely and incrementally move ourselves to a world where teams have their own database instance with their data. This is a rough outline of the plan we came up with. 
Phase one, draw ownership boundaries in the sand, defining domains. Make it possible to enforce boundaries, but don't. Phase two, give teams the tools to reduce the access to their own domain, one user or group or team at a time. It might cause an outage, but if it does, it's very fast to revert with a very narrow blast radius. Also, we now have some assurances on who needs to build services and for whom. Lastly, a team that manages to reduce access down to itself can now be safely moved to a different database instance. What made this plan different? We stopped the bleeding without necessitating any large changes from teams. The only change they need to do for phase one is replace the credentials used to connect to the database. We tackled every code change we could ourselves. We automated everything that was remotely possible to automate. We gave teams the power and control to go through access reduction themselves. If actually no one depends on their data, they can move fast. If someone does depend on their data, there are clear goals for building services and it's clear which teams would need to migrate to use them. And while we don't answer all the questions, because does anyone ever? We thought of and answered the big ones. We did a lot of the work ourselves upfront. Most importantly, we didn't ask for trust. We showed teams across Datadog that we are willing to put in the work before we ask anyone else to do anything. Armed with a plan and a little bit of tailwind of fortuitous timing, we were ready to execute. However, once we had a plan, we also had some clue of how long it will actually take. Whoever was leading this project would have to put in a lot of time to see it through. This is a rough timeline. It was becoming clear that Rick and I couldn't own it. A single engineer or two shouldn't be responsible for a project with ongoing maintenance and operational load, not to mention the need to support multiple teams in parallel. There needed to be a team to take over and go the distance. Fortunately for us, our friends in the Postgres as a service team with whom we've been collaborating were interested in taking over. This effort aligns well with their interests. They had people and the expertise. Even better, an amazing senior engineer on the team, Fabiana, was interested in leading it, which meant I needed to let it go. This is obviously a little easier said than done. So for a little while, I continued to work with the team, joining stand-up meetings, writing automation code, and discovering how much I can apparently hold in my head to be used to assist in debugging. I really loved being part of a team like this, hands-on towards a goal I believe in, so I held on just a little longer. Fabiana and the team were pretty patient with me. Thank you for that. But eventually, it was really time for me to get out of their way. This wasn't the first time, nor will it be the last time, that I will let go of a project. It's sad, but also rewarding. Handing the lead of a project off to an awesome engineer, believing that this will serve as a stepping stone for them, and that you'll get to cheer them on from the bench, is bittersweet, but mostly sweet. Which you know, like with every change, left me to ask, what's my job again? Again. I went to find another problem to work on, but enough about me. Projecting all these efforts forward, they intersperse well with each other. As the API framework integrates more closely with Postgres as a service, developers will get a more streamlined experience with best practices built in when creating services. Postgres as a service gets increasing adoption, both with new services and as the migration out of the monolith moves ahead, increasing the confidence in the platform. And finally, the maturation of tools for breaking up that monolithic shared database results in the migration getting less and less risky and less work intensive, all contributing to that bright future being within reach. Gotta love it when things work out this way. As I was looking back on this experience, I realized that I learned quite a bit. I learned the technical debt comes with context, and zooming out to acquire that context could help a lot. Understand what bits of that context are the critical pieces that were or are working against you. Will changing these context parameters be possible on their own merit? Will it pass a cost-benefit analysis in its own right? If not, 
Does your pet peeve have enough impact to justify it? I learned to approach resistance with curiosity. You might be surprised by what you find. I learned that people won't take your word for it, nor should they. Try as you might, people need to experience the problem before any initiative for change can be pushed forward. Let it manifest. Or, you know, accept that you might be wrong and this is not really a problem. I learned that all of these things take a long time and having the right amount of patience is a virtue. Problems have a way of getting solved with or without you. Tackle your pet peeve when the time and setting looks right. If it's not working and you still believe in it, check your story and your context. One of them might still be off. I learned that things move more smoothly if more people's incentives are aligned. I learned again that letting go is hard, but rewarding. It is a privilege to be able to support other people's growth and we shouldn't squander it. It also means we did a good job, I think. Lastly, it's nice to have some good luck. It won't replace any of these other things, but it never hurts. With that, I wish you luck with all of your pet peeves.